Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Matt Yonkel. He's an inventor and developer of TurboTap beer dispensing technology that has several patents. The idea stemmed from waiting in long lines for beer at the Memorial Union at University of Wisconsin, Madison. The device pours beer up to four times faster than conventional taps, wastes significantly less beer due to reduced overflowing and spillage. They're in many stadiums across the U.S., including Wrigley Field, White Sox Stadium, and many more. They were Popular Science Top Product of the Year and Time Magazine Best Inventions of the Year. And he also co-founded Murphy, which takes your CDs off your hands, digitizes your collection, so you can access it in the cloud and, and recycles a plastic case, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, Amazing. That's, the yeah, most exactly. important part of your bio is uh, that you were a badger. Um, and so I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, big mistakes along the journey, what worked, what didn't work. And I always yeah. like to include a fun fact, Matt. And thank you so much for, for joining me, by the way. Um, oh, you're welcome. Glad, glad to be here. So, so fun fact. Fun fact most, most... is that you actually – Invented a food that was first to be grown in space. Oh, I didn't. I didn't invent the food. I was on the team that uh, created technologies that were, were the first to grow food in space. That's so, pretty cool. Um, so there, there were two two aspects of the team. There were sort of like the technical engineering guys that actually built the growth chamber and the environment that allowed um, the food, in this case, potatoes, to be wow. grown in zero g. And then there was the the team that sort of did all the botany and kind of actually mm -hmm. delivered the plant. So um, yeah, we grew we successfully grew potatoes on a on a sixteen day uh, space shuttle Columbia mission. Uh, From that to yeah. TurboTap, that's pretty amazing. So yep. I, my question when I was looking through your story and doing the research, Matt, how did you figure out the beer tap was a bottleneck? Because it could have been the person at the register, the layout of the bar. What was your method for figuring that out? Um, well, I mean, those other things are bottlenecks, so there's lots of bottlenecks um, when, when folks pour beer. But I was being a college student at the time, that was my focus. You know, that was the obvious one that was, you know, you could put, it, you could put a stopwatch to it. So I think that's why that one stood out, mm -hmm. you know, whereas every transaction sort of takes different amounts of time. You know, it took a minute to pour a pitcher of beer, so that was, that was a pretty easy one to quantify. And, so, and, and it, it seemed like the most readily addressable Right, without getting into human factors and all the other things right. that would sort of involve making the line move faster in other ways, um, you know, there's always the there's always the case where somebody, you know, you have this long line and and the person in front of you gets up to the counter and they, they've had ten minutes to decide what they want to order and they get up there and like, oh, what should I order? Well, you just <laughs> thought of that. So I mean, that stuff is never going to go away. You can't create a product that sort of right. you know like tells people to think of stuff. But um, but the but you know as an engineer that was the, the the pouring faster was something I could sink my teeth around. So what were some of the challenges of creating that physical product? Um, well, one of the I mean it was it was a challenge and also one of the fun aspects is that um, when working with beer, there's really no way to simulate it aside from using real beer. Uh, so you, you couldn't you couldn't effectively try and test something. Uh, unless you had a keg in the office, um, because like water wasn't carbonated, carbonated water behaves differently. Beer is is an organic, is very organic in in, in a way, I and mean, it's it's sort of like there's living stuff inside of it, and sort of every, you know. So that's one that was one of the big challenges is, is you know how do you set up and test, um, and you know the TurboTap was one of those projects or products that wasn't it wasn't the case of oh I was waiting in line for a beer and I had this revolution of what it would look like and exactly how the product would function. The waiting in line was recognizing the problem, mm -hmm. um, and in some cases we didn't. I mean, you know, and it was like, well, the beer is pouring too slowly. So recognizing that problem, then how do you then create that solution? And that was very iterative. So that was a lot of trial and error, R and D, research and drinking, as I like to jokingly call yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, so, and that was a that was an evolution, um, and you know, just a lot of trial and error in that case. Yeah, you're sticking to that story. We need beer to test this, so we always have to have a keg around. What was? Yep. <laughs> What was, um, you know, I thought it was interesting about your story that after you invented it, you got the patent and then you went to work for some startups. What, what made you go on that path and then brought you back to TurboTap? Well, the, so we, um, so I, I was, it was, it was a team of, I guess, college, like myself and two other coll uh, colleagues from college that were both engineers that sort of created TurboTap 1.0, if you want to call it that. 
And that product was never really fully baked. We had sort of kind of proof of concept. We never really had something that was very manufacturable. Mm -hmm. But we took it we took it around and we tried to license it to a bunch of breweries. And, and ultimately, we ended up in a meeting at Anheuser Busch with some of the top brass, and we pulled the product out. And we had all this build up. We had the PowerPoint and how this would revolutionize beer and how Anheuser Busch should, should you know, cut an exclusive licensing deal with us and all the benefits that that would. Uh, create and then when it came time to actually show off the product, it failed miserably. So we, we couldn't pour anything but foam at that particular meeting. Um, so we didn't. We, there was something about the product that wasn't right, and they saw it and they were you know they were disappointed because they wanted it to work, and we were disappointed. And so that was sort of like a like the end of that sort of phase. That sort of you know college kids going and pitching this concept. Um, I graduated and had 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 a great opportunity to hook up with a startup that was doing video and audio streaming. My background is computer science and electrical engineering, so it just seemed like a better fit and a better way to kind of go. And so TurboTap got shelved. Um, it kind of sat, you know, in kind of in a garage in a closet for a few years. And then it was when the dot-com bubble burst in 01, 02, where I kind of was like, well, you know, I really don't have a lot of other stuff to do. This TurboTap thing never really got resolved. I don't know what went wrong. I'd like to figure it out. I was a better engineer. I was a better business person at that time. So I'll take another crack at this, good, better, otherwise. It'll be my only crack, but I'll see it all the way through to the end. And so in 2002, I kind of resurrected things and, and, and re-engineered the product. And most of the patents came out of that sort of second generation or TurboTap 2.0. Yeah. And so, that's really the product that took off. Yeah. So, Matt, what's been a proud moment for you with TurboTap when you think back? Oh, I mean, like, like the seeing the product installed and used at so Wrigley Field. So we did a full installation there. And, and for me as an engineer, I'm most rewarded when you see people using a product that you help build. Yeah. Like that is the most rewarding thing. And so walking around Wrigley Field and seeing everybody walking around with their beers and knowing that just about every one of those beers came through my product was super rewarding. So I get goosebumps still thinking about it. And so, you know, with Murphy, you know, I want to see a million people on our platform. Right? Like that's like, like it is as an engineer. I mean, some people like to um, like, like inventors, I think like to just sort of create the products. I think innovators and entrepreneurs like to see lots of people use their product. Like yeah. I want to get out there. Like that's how I know I'm successful. And that's really what drives me. That's the biggest reward is seeing lots of people use this stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, with, um, you know, TurboTap, I know you, you know, you get a lot of people pitching you ideas, asking for advice. What kind of important advice do you give startups or entrepreneurs? Uh, one of them is, you know, you, like no one is going to have more passion for your own idea than you. Um, because a lot of people like to, they come in and they're, they're looking for a co-founder, they're looking for a partner, and they're all too eager to say, oh, you can have half or you can have, you know, whatever it is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's sort of like, well, I only know, you know, I've got this great idea, and, but I need someone to run with it. Well, if you're not willing to run with it, it's going to be really hard to find somebody else that you can convince to take it on and run with it. Like, it's got to be, it's your effort. It's, it's not as much. The ideas are the easy part. This is Thomas Edison, right? So the, the ideas are really the easy part. It's easy to generate lots of great ideas. Yeah. It's hard to implement them. Um, you know, that's why when you license a patent, you know, typical royalties are 2 to 10%. Right? Like 2 to 10%. That's what, that's what a patented idea is worth. That's an idea that's been very well flushed out. Right. Never mind just sort of an idea on a napkin. You know, what's that worth? You know, 1%, less than 1%. Ideas are really easy. So you've got to have that passion to really see that idea through. Yeah. And so I want to talk about Murphy for a second. What's um, one of the toughest parts about running Murphy? And then I want to hear about what has helped you get some traction. Yeah, I mean, the, the music space, you know, online music space is tough. One of the toughest parts is just that you've got a lot of players and the ante is very high. So just the, the general level of, of expectation for any product you put out in the consumer music space is very high. So, so we have to build a lot of things that every other music service has, um, as well as build what makes Murphy unique. Mm -hmm. um, that, and that kind of makes, makes a company like Murphy harder because you have to have all this expertise and you have, you have a lot of work just to sort of get to the starting line. And then once you're there, then it's like, how do you get the word out about how you're unique and, and everything else? So that's been the, you know, that's been probably the kind of the hardest thing. And then, you know, so I couple that with, you know, Murphy, a lot of what we do is a marketplace. And so marketplaces are tricky. They're very powerful when they're built and you have liquidity, but um, you need to sort of, you need to get buyers, you need to get sellers, you need to get them in the right amount and sort yeah. of grow from there. And so that's the other kind of tricky aspect to Murphy. Yeah. So, I mean, the way we get, the way we get traction is, is, you know, we, you know, we engage with, 
passionate music collectors. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we're about. We're about building the future of music collecting. So we provide a path forward for your existing music, your physical collection, your CDs, your vinyl. We enable you to send that to the cloud in a way that preserves the equity, makes all that equity transactable. And then we offer the marketplace so you continue to collect, truly collect music and that you have equity in the cloud. Um, and you know, it's been our customers that have been kind of really good about getting the word out. A lot of SEO. We've had a little bit of favorable press now and then, but you know, we just we just sort of continue to to fight and to get the word out however we can. And um, we've got a great product, and so people keep coming back and they buy lots of music and they keep sending in their stuff, and that gets kind of builds upon itself. Yeah. Um, you know, the way you build the marketplace, right. so organically and authentically. So do people ship all the, do they actually keep, the, do you keep the physical goods for them or do they choose whether they want to keep it or not? Uh, our, our customers can choose. Okay. Um, uh, we've got about 500,000, a little over 500,000 CDs that wow. have arrived um, here, that customers store here, and then you know, thousands more that, that customers have sent in that kind of have digitized and then we've, we've kind of sent them back. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, but a lot of people keep them here. The reason to keep them here with Murphy is because that, that makes them transactable. Um, so by having the CDs on our shelves here, we can we can afford this. iTunes meets eBay, so we're the only place online where we've got this merged primary secondary market where all the transactions are can kind of happen instantly, whether you sell or trade. Um, and that's you know that's one of the things about collecting and one of the things about having equity in your music that we think is important to really demonstrate. Like that's how buying music on Murphy is different than buying something on iTunes or streaming yeah. it on Spotify. Yeah, Matt, I appreciate your time. I have one last question for you. And I know you've given a lot of advice. Who's been an influential mentor for you and the good advice they've given you throughout the years? Uh, I've, had, I've had a few. I mean, one of, one of the, one of the um, gentlemen I always kind of look back to is, is Richard Schuess. And he um, was a benefactor of, of, a, of, a, of an invention or an engineering contest on the UW campus. This was way back to you know, before business plan competitions were really even on anyone's radar. But he, 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 he um, funded innovation. Days, which was where TurboTap made its debut, uh, and it was a contest for um, for a patentable invention. And so we entered TurboTap, and we we took first place. But um, Dick's advice was, or his, his, sort of his message to engineers, is that you know, he looked at like kind of three things that um, there are a lot of things that, that make people successful. But he, he said the three things that he really focuses in on are creativity, uh, leadership, and communication skills. So those sort of three elements are really core among um, folks that are really able to have a lot of success in life. So if you can, you can kind of work on those things. Creativity, you can debate whether you're kind of born with it or whether you're able to develop it. But creativity around something, leadership is certainly something you can always work on as are communication skills. And that, I think, for a lot of engineers, I mean, that that's sort of the important thing that, that you know, if you're, if you're good at creating a product, you need to also be good at selling it and good at explaining it. And I think yeah. that's, you know, that really got me focused on, you know, how can you be a you know, well-rounded um, entrepreneur, well-rounded inventor. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate it. Everyone check out murphy.com, TurboTap, and have a wonderful rest of your week, Matt. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate the opportunity.